But let's address the elephant in the room. The most obvious difference between the two cuts is the soundtrack, and it's a big one. The film was originally scored by legendary American composer Jerry Goldsmith, who worked in many genres during a career spanning six decades, but is probably best known among fantastical film fans for his work on classics like The Omen, Planet of the Apes, Star Trek, Alien, Poltergeist, and Gremlins. Alien marked his first collaboration with Ridley Scott, and despite finding it a frustrating experience, during which his cues were re-edited, repositioned, and even replaced, he agreed to work with the director again. He delivered a sumptuous score, combining the forces of a full symphony orchestra, choir, and Goldsmith's characteristic battery of synthesizers to add a magical quality with both a hint of Grimm's fairy tales and Disney classics. The soundtrack also included four original songs with lyrics penned by John Bettis, best known for his collaborations with The Carpenters. Three of the songs were to be sung by Lily in the movie, and there are two dance sequences, all of which had to be composed in advance so that the music could be played on set during filming. All of the songs are diegetic. They occur within the world of the story, rather than being show-stopping breaks from its reality. Lily sings to herself on the way to the cottage, to the unicorns to soothe and lure them, and to Jack to soothe his nerves after she's touched his secret unicorn. Her third song even includes the answer to the riddle Gump asks Jack later on. The result is a finely crafted, carefully interwoven collaboration of hundreds of musical artists, creating a timeless, epic world of shimmering beauty. And terrifying power. It feels classically fairy tale and classic Hollywood. It's beautifully done, and it feels like an album I'll play while making Christmas cookies each year. But for me, it's less impactful, mostly because of its generally happy, upbeat tone. There's musically no threat of impending danger or sadness. Unfortunately, the film was considered to be problematic in test screenings. When this happens, one of the things producers often consider is a change in the score, because the soundtrack plays a huge role in establishing the tone and emotional quality of a movie. It's also less expensive to change than the visuals, which would require reshoots. Sidney Scheinberg, president and CEO of Universal, decided the film needed a commercial pop soundtrack to attract the youth market. Ridley made a fairy tale, a breakthrough visual film, Tom Cruise said to Interview Magazine in May 1986. I think the studio thought the whole piece was a little too romantic. So instead of just releasing it, Ridley said, OK, let's go back and rescore it and give it a little harder edge. They hired German New Age electronic group Tangerine Dream, not coincidentally fresh from their success scoring another Tom Cruise movie. The result is markedly different for sure, full of sampled pan pipes, analog synth pads, and kinetic drum loops. This was my first exposure to Tangerine Dream, or electronica with world music themes. A huge part of why I love this movie is the music. It's eerie, mystical, and foreboding. It appeals to my love of the minor keys prevalent in heavy metal, and this worked with the demonic visage of darkness so well that when I discovered death and doom metal later in the 90s, I think the atmosphere and imagery of this version was the foundation that my love for that music was built upon. On the other hand, I wish they had used real instruments rather than synthy samples, more like Dead Can Dance. There are sequences I like, but others fall flat for me. In particular, the plinky-plonky cheesiness of the dress waltz undermines the mystery, allure and terror of what is essentially Darkness's seduction of Lily to the dark side. I do prefer the Tangerine Dream dance section. It reminds me of a music box. But again, I would definitely have preferred the same notes be played with real instruments rather than the synth, especially here. 
Tangerine Dream score didn't escape studio interference. Without the band's knowledge or approval, the band's final cue was overlaid with a vocal by Yes frontman John Anderson, singing lyrics he penned himself. Anderson had recently released three albums of collaborations with another electronic artist, Vangelis, who had just scored Ridley Scott's previous movie. Add to that a Brian Ferry track for the end credits called Is Your Love Strong Enough, which got its own music video featuring Ferry in the most 80s jacket ever. And the result surely is that teen market blockbuster hit the studio executives dreamed of, right? Nope. It bombed, big time. Only managed to pull in 15.5 million in the US box office. But I'm sure the European version scored internationally, right? Um... Right, Conrad? Okay, okay. It only managed to net $8 million there, so it was a failure all round. Studio executive Sidney Scheinberg went on to suggest to Robert Zemeckis that he change the title of Back to the Future to Spaceman from Pluto, despite the film not featuring either Spacemen or Pluto, and personally greenlit Howard the Duck. But he also shepherded Jaws and Schindler's List to the big screen, so maybe we should cut him some slack. For his part, Ridley Scott regretted swapping out the scores. I think uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score, with respect to Tangerine Dream, was still the best. And I think it was an error to remove it from the American version, because Jerry delivered exactly and more what I had originally asked for. And so on hearing this score again recently on this version, I realized that, you know what? Your first intuition is usually right the first time. You should stay with it. <laughs> 